Hi everyone, uh, James here. Welcome to another video. This is going to be a, a, a response to this uh, marvellous thread uh, which Joe has started. Beatles albums which bring back certain memories. I've seen so many great entries to this. Beatle Brad, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Street and Joe's entry of course and Paul fit to be tie-dyed. Great idea, just gives us a chance to kind of touch on some emotional issues and you know personal stories so I hope you enjoy my entry. I'm going to go through these roughly in chronological order uh, as my life unfolds. The first one, Let It Be. This is a slightly strange one because the memory I have of this is not actually of the record but of the, of the book. When I was a kid I got into the Beatles by accident really. When Paul McCartney had Mull of Kintyre in the charts I was very taken with it. And my dad, it turned out my dad had a, a, an old copy of Revolver in his collection from the 60s, which he dug out and gave me. And uh, I just loved this record, and I became quite obsessed with it. And, um, but my dad had a work colleague who was quite a Beatles fan, and he lent us, not the record, but the book, you know, the big book that came with the initial release. Um, and he lent us this book, and I was completely taken with this and it was quite good because we just moved into a new house until I was about five years old we lived in one particular place and then we moved and I'd only just started school so I had to kind of start again new friends and everything new neighborhood and it was during the summer holiday so I hadn't actually started at the new school yet so I, I really was finding my feet and I didn't really know anybody and I was kind of a bit kind of nervous a bit unsettled so what I used to do, and we kind of moved into this new house where there were kind of no carpets on the floor yet, everything was very bare, I used to go into what ultimately became my dad's study and sit on the floor in there and just look at this book. Um, I used to just go through it and I was just fascinated by the pictures. Um, there's something about the photos in that book, you know, the Beatles look so kind of serious and uh, intent and there's all those kind of mysterious pictures of John and Yoko and it, it was all completely new to me, you know, the Beatles phenomenon. I didn't really understand it. I don't think I'd seen any film footage at that point of kind of Shea Stadium or anything. So it was kind of like it just exploring this mystery and the Let It Be book with the pictures on the front as well, you know, they look so different to how they'd appeared on Revolver and that was really what kind of started getting me interested in just the whole story of the Beatles and the enigma of it all and it provided such a lot of comfort to me during that summer when everything was so sort of unsettled new house new situation you know and uh, I was kind of making friends with the Beatles uh, until I was able to start school and uh, make some proper friends so that was in 1976 by the time it came to about 1978, I was a fully fledged Paul McCartney nut, a uh, big, big fan of his. Uh, I'd heard Band on the Run by then and loved it. And I was such a big fan and I, I had a Paul McCartney scrapbook, which my grandmother used to help me make. And But I'd still not seen much of him on the TV, you know, I'd seen the Mullock Kintyre video promo. Um, maybe with a little look had been out by then and famously the BBC did a very very good interview with him with Melvin Bragg on the South Bank show and that was the first time I'd seen him being interviewed that was in 1978 and I, I, I kind of started to see bits of foot, um, footage of Shea Stadium and so on but I still hadn't seen a lot of like live footage and I was on holiday with my parents in a little seaside town which I loved uh, it was a holiday that I used to love going on. We used to stay in this big old-fashioned sort of harbour master's mansion uh, on the seafront, which was owned by some of our friends who ran a little... Um, it was like a sort of activity centre in this old house, and we used to go and stay there. And I, and I used to go... I used to love walking off in the hills and the mountains and so on. And one day we were out walking, and my mum just said, I've got a surprise for you. And I said, what is it? And she said, I'm not going to tell you, but it's tonight. And she wouldn't give me any clues whatsoever. And it got to the evening and I was beside myself with excitement. We were all staying in this little apartment in this old kind of, in this old house. We had this little cosy room with a little gas fire. And we sort of sat on the sofa and my mum put the telly on and onto the TV came the Wings Over America film. 
and it just blew my little mind. It was the first time I'd seen Paul McCartney doing live versions of all those songs that I loved, you know, Band on the Run and Jet, and with all the footage and everything, it was just manna from heaven, you know. And it was so great because she said it was going to be a surprise, but she, but she kept it secret, you know, all day. And uh, it was the best, the best surprise in the world. I didn't get this album until quite a few years later, but Wings Over America always kind of held a special place in my heart because it was the first time on TV that I'd seen McCartney really strutting his stuff, you know, at, in a kind of solo context. Okay, so then the next one is a slightly unhappier one. We've all had, I think everybody's shown something to commemorate uh, the death of John. Most people have shown Double Fantasy. So I thought I wouldn't show that, I'd show this one, which I was given this shortly after John's death. I did get Double Fantasy as well, but this record uh, was bought for me by my mum and dad pretty much straight after John's death. And it was my first exposure to the Beatles' kind of early rock and roll stuff. And I just used to sit in my room listening to these songs and just asking myself, you know, why? Why, why has this happened? And I used to look at the cover and just look at John and I used to just look at him and go, how, how can he be dead, you know? I'd only just started getting into the Beatles properly and all of a sudden he'd been taken away, you know. But this picture brings back great memories. Uh, I just used to think they just look so kind of happy in the photo. If you compare it to the photos in the Let It Be book, you know, there's just no comparison. They just look so sort of youthful and full of vim and energy. The music obviously is, is just really earthy. It was the first time I'd heard music like that really, because I'd, I'd never heard any of the original rock and rollers at that age. I was still only maybe 10, 10 years old. So I'd never heard Chuck Berry, I'd never heard you know, Carl Perkins or anything. So this was like a bolt out of the blue for me really, the Beatles roots. When I was about 12, we went on holiday to a place called Bude in Cornwall, and it was a fantastic yearly ritual. It, it, it kind of turned into a yearly ritual. We would go there every year and meet up with a big kind of extended lot of family and friends down there. And we'd all have beach huts in a row. And we used to do bodyboarding and miniature golf. It was just a great kind of, kind of child's holiday, you know. When I was 12, I was starting to get a little bit of independence. And I used to, it was the first holiday where I'd gone off and explored by myself a little bit. My parents allowed me to go up into the town, to the bookshop there. And I was allowed in the morning to get up in the morning in the little B&B &B that we were staying in and walk to the beach uh, by myself, you know, while my parents were still in bed and so on. I would take myself off in the morning and kind of, you know, get, just get the day started. And on that holiday, I found in a shop a cassette of Wildlife and I knew nothing about this album, I'd never heard of it but I'd only just, maybe a year before, had my first Sonny Walkman. The first cassette I ever had was Tug of War but I found this on this holiday and there was something about the music, it's just a very sort of summary album, you know, tracks like um, Some People Never Know and I Am Your Singer and Tomorrow which kind of describes a summer's day and it was one of those great sort of holidays which just get branded into your memory because it was really sunny for a fortnight. And anybody who's been to Cornwall or seen photographs of Cornwall will know what a lovely place it is, you know. To have this album just ringing in my ears for the whole two weeks was great. I used to walk to the beach in the morning. I used to queue up side two a lot. I used to love side two of this. And some people know it was just this sort of really long, kind of meandering, hippy-dippy kind of song, you know, and it just kind of summed up that holiday for me. Uh, so I've, I've always been really fond of this record, even though it doesn't have a great reputation. That's uh, Wings and Wildlife. So, skip ahead now, and I was 16 or 15, and nobody has shown this yet, so I'm going to show it. Press to Play, when it was released, was the first time that I'd ever known that a Paul McCartney record was coming out. Because back in the day, back in the 1970s and 80s, living in North Wales like I did as a child, you know, I didn't read the music press, I never knew when records were coming out. You know, my favourite band, Squeeze, I, I never knew when there was going to be a new Squeeze album. I would just go to a record shop, look under the S section, and either there was a new Squeeze record there, uh, or there wasn't, you know. And it was the same for Paul McCartney. I, I never knew when there was a new Paul album coming out. But of course, he made it, he'd, there was a special interview filmed for him 
with, with Richard Skinner for this album and so it was a great sort of exciting feeling like oh wow there's a new Paul McCartney record coming out and it was the first time I'd ever seen him talking about music which I hadn't heard yet you know so I had this record for Christmas and what this album really reminds me of and it's a bit embarrassing but when I was in my teens I decided that I wanted to be an actor I'd always been good at acting and good at drama at school and I got a bit of a major obsession at the time with Dustin Hoffman, the actor. I got really, really into watching his movies and I started to really fancy myself as an actor. I started to think that's what I want to do. I want to go, I want to, go to drama college, I want to study to be a kind of great kind of, you know, screen actor. And this was the album that happened to be on my turntable while I was nursing those sort of fantasies, you know. Um, and I just used to listen to it and just imagine myself as this kind of you know, Dustin Hoffman style actor, which of course never happened. Um, but I love that, I love the way that memories, when it comes to records and things, it just kind of random associations happen. And uh, that's very much the case for this. With Flowers in the Dirt, this reminds me of passing my driving test when I was 17 and going away on holiday for the first time with my mates. I knew I had to pass the driving test because if I didn't pass it then we wouldn't be able to go. So there was a lot riding on it and I had failed my first driving test and because I'd nearly killed somebody on my first test I failed to stop at a zebra crossing when a young mother had just stepped onto it pushing a pushchair. Goodness knows why. And the driving examiner had to put his brake on so I failed. The second test rolled around and We'd booked a holiday. My, my, and my parents had booked a caravan on the northwest Wales coast, and uh, so I had to pass my driving test or we couldn't go, you know, and I passed it. So we all took off in my little Citroen 2CV Dolly Green and White, which had a retractable roof. And this was the record that we listened to all the way through that week on a cassette. We had it on a cassette and we listened to it and we listened to it and we listened to it, and it soundtracked my first experience of going away on holiday. It was quite a long way from my parents' house. It was about, probably about 60 or 70 miles away. So it was a big deal, you know, to go off in a car for the first time, rip the old plates off the car, pull the roof back, sun was shining, my brave face on the car stereo, and, uh, off, you know, off we went. And uh, it, it just brings back great, great memories, this record, for that reason. Flowers in the Dirt. Now, what this album really strongly reminds me of is the year 1989, oddly enough. I didn't discover this when it first came out. I don't know why, I just didn't listen to it, but I finally got into it the summer before I went to university. I went to uni in October of 1989, and I'd got into this album the previous summer, or that summer, the summer of 1989. And what this album really strongly reminds me of is just having a final summer at home with my parents. It was the last summer that I spent under their roof because I went away to university and kind of never looked back. You know, I, when I finished at uni, I went straight to Leeds to, uh, to live with my friends and to it kind of embark upon a kind of mad life, you know, trying to be an actor and, and you know, doing writing stuff and just trying to become rich and famous, you know, which never happened. But the summer, that summer at my parents' house, I seem to remember, it was just kind of happy time, but it was a time of uncertainty, you know, not really knowing what was round the corner, not knowing whether university was going to work out or not, or whether I was going to be happy there. But having finished my exams and got all that work out of the way, you know, and just being relaxed and thinking, okay, well, there's a big challenge around the corner, but it, it's not here yet. And, you know, for now I can just enjoy myself and just enjoy these last few weeks at home with mum and dad and uh, Cloud Nine is the album that soundtracked that so very special now when I got into my 20s after I'd graduated and I moved to Leeds and led a very odd life for a number of years trying to get various careers off the ground various projects some of which worked and some of which didn't and I kind of drifted a little and my life, I wouldn't say it went off the rails, but it, I lost direction for a while and became sort of quite unhappy. Life became quite chaotic. Opportunities didn't seem to be coming along. 
there were a few breaks, that, a few bad breaks that we had, you know, me and my friends. Didn't, we didn't quite manage to get where we wanted to be and I became quite despondent. And I, but I used to go home to my parents quite regularly in North Wales and just try and sort of ease myself back into the kind of life that I'd had when I was younger and, you know, kind of more simpler times. And one thing I used to do, I used to love to sweep my parents' back garden because their back garden has high trees all around. And in the autumn, the, all the leaves fall and just cover the lawn. And a job that I'd always loved doing back since I was a kid is just raking leaves in the garden into piles and putting them into this big dustbin. So I came home a little bit worse for wear and said to my mum, can I go and rake the leaves, you know, like I used to? And she said, yeah, of course. And I had my personal stereo on me and I spent a lovely afternoon just raking leaves in my parents' garden and talking to myself and saying, look, None of this stuff which is happening really is that important. You've got people who love you, you know, life is as it always was. And the record that I listened to that afternoon on my personal stereo was this one, Milk and Honey. Particularly the song Living on Borrowed Time, which has such a great little message to it, you know. It makes you realise that you, you sort of have to live your life as if you're living on borrowed time and, and to live in the moment and to not worry. And it, it just fitted perfectly with that day of being in the garden, raking leaves, thinking to myself, I'm going to go back up the motorway tonight, back to Leeds, I'm going to confront whatever is happening and get over it, you know, things will happen, things will work out okay. Not that they did for John, but the, but the music on the album, to me, just seemed very spiritually uplifting, and that's what this album now reminds me of. So, John Lennon, Milk and Honey. All Things Must Pass. Now this, this is a quite an odd album and I've realised that I've done these records out of sequence really, but it doesn't really matter. So let's just backtrack a little bit. When I went to university, um, I had a friend from back home and I kept trying to get him to visit me at uni because he was a good friend, but he wasn't the kind of person who was ever going to go to university. He didn't like that kind of thing. He'd left school at 16, got a job. He wasn't into students and the student lifestyle. I kept try and I kept trying to persuade him to come and he wouldn't, you know. But I finally persuaded him in my second year and he came to visit me and he brought with him when he came a cassette of All Things Must Pass and I'd never heard it before. He was a big Beatles fan. He recorded it for me and he arrived at the train station and gave it to me and said, you must hear this, this is incredible. And we went back to my house and put it on and sure enough, it was just this mind blowing album, you know. But the weirdest thing about that visit was, we went out that night to a party and my friend met the girl that he was destined to marry. He met her at the party. It was a Rubik's Cube party, which is a party where you all go dressed and you have each garment you wear is a different colour and as the party wears on throughout the evening you have to swap with people so that you all end up wearing the same colour at the end. And we got a bit drunk you know and he ended up sat on the stairs with this girl and they were going to swap garments or whatever and just one thing led to another and by the end of the week because he was staying with me for a week he'd hooked up with this girl and within a couple of weeks they'd moved in together and they'd been married now for many years. So, what an amazing thing to happen for him, but I mean, he, he arrived at the train station bearing a cassette of All Things Must Pass, having no idea that that very day he was to meet uh, the girl with whom he was going to spend the rest of his life. Um, so, yeah, mind-blowing stuff. George Harrison, All Things Must Pass. Just two CDs to show you before we finish. In my first year at uni, I was a little bit kind of shy and lonely really. I had friends, but I kind of liked being on my own. I've always enjoyed being on my own listening to music. And this is my original CD copy of Sgt Pepper bought from the Beatles shop in Liverpool, uh, which Beatle Brad talked about. I would have bought this in around about 1989. And I've just, what this really strongly reminds me of is just sat in my bedroom listening to it. I had this little cell-like room, you know, and uh, it was just so great to be able to escape into the world of Sgt Pepper. It was the first time really that I'd explored the album and it just strongly evokes memories of sort of being in halls, we call it, in, uh, in halls, uh, you know, residential halls at university. And um, yeah, that whole sort of bit, bittersweet memories uh, of my first year at uni. 
And to finish, let's backtrack back to when I was a kid. After Let It Be, after I discovered Revolver, I used to, we used to have some family up in Scotland. It was my mum's cousin and her sons, and they were Scottish. And I, I, I loved these boys, my Sc Scottish cousins, Paul and Colin. I haven't seen them for years and years, but I did, I've got this really strong memory of listening to the Blue Album in their living room. I'd never seen it before, I'd never heard it before, and I remember, I can still remember in my mind's ear, Sergeant Pepper, uh, Strawberry Fields, being on the turntable and hearing the chorus, and my cousin, Paul, who I idolised, he would have been about four years older than me. I was probably about eight, and he was probably about 12, you know. And he was singing along to this song, Strawberry Fields Forever, and I just remember thinking, wow, you know, what an amazing song. And it was quite sad because what happened was my mum's cousin, uh, uh, Paul and Colin's mum, uh, she died not that long after of a, um, a brain tumour. And when that happened, my parents never really stayed in touch uh, with her husband, Donald. <laughs> so we kind of lost touch with them. So what this record reminds me of is just in childhood, just having these great, cool, older, cousins who I just loved and sort of hero worshipped but I haven't seen them since I was a kid I could get in touch with them I know where they are but it would seem a little bit strange after all these years I'm, you know I'm now 45 and I haven't seen them since I was about uh, maybe 12 or 13 one day I must do it but that's what this album particularly reminds me of of course this is my CD copy of it I don't have it on vinyl so those are my Beatle memories. I hope you enjoyed it. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Joe, for this thread. Fantastic idea. See you all soon. Bye.